I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Cry Oneness, a show where you can share your miracles, share your lives, share your poetry, your music, your beliefs, an all-inclusive show for everybody to share what's right with the world. Cry out the word, Jeremiah. Believe in miracles, Jeremiah. Don't lose heart, Jeremiah. Use the narrow gate, Jeremiah. The four main principles of Cry Oneness when I thought I was going to start evangelizing in 2010, but got a little sidetracked until I met Bob Olson again at my father's house in Moody's, Connecticut, a year and a half ago, and was awarded this great show by, by Bob Olson and Sebastian. Such a pleasure to be here tonight with my co-host, Bill Ailes, how are you doing tonight, Phil? Actually, I'm doing quite well. Thank you, Joe. It's always good to be here. God bless you. I'm going to do the short version of the serenity prayer and then move on. I'm going to do the we version. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Very appropriate. And I also want to get into something I got from Richard Rohr website, the Daily Meditations. He had a quote from a Jewish rabbi named Ramai Shapiro, and it's it's amazing. It really does such a good job of describing God the Father that I'm not even going to try to beat it ever again. God is, I am, not a being or even a supreme being, but being itself. Each of us is a keeper of the I am, just as a wave is a keeper of the ocean in its particular place and time. So are you a keeper of God in your particular place and time. To realize this about yourself is to realize it about all beings. Rabbi Sham, Ramai Shapiro. How close we all are without knowing it, huh? How, how collective the spirit is that unites everybody and disregards completely people's faith and background and his being itself. God the Father is everywhere, every place, and everything. The original Baltimore Catechism. Love your brother with your entire heart, and love your God as yourself. The two main spiritual love principles that was so simple to understand back in the 60s and 50s, and so complicated these days with an 1153-page catechism of what not to do. What do you think, Bill? Well, you know, interestingly enough, Joe, that's ex- Exactly what I wanted to uh, share on this evening was, um, you know, the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, you, you actually went to exactly where I wanted to go, which was, um, you know, the um, Pharisees, you know, were talking to him, you know, what are the, or what's the greatest commandments, you know, of the law? And Christ said, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So since, since you know, God revealed himself to mankind as the I Am, uh, this, these commandments have been central to his desire for us because he knows if we do this, then we have our life preserved uh, in this life and for eternity, you know, because he is, you know, God is love, as John said. And, you know, in the face of whatever is happening around us, you know, the, you know, the, what's happening in the airways of life, the negative spirit is energy that's, you know, all around us. We still can be keepers of God, like you were saying, keepers of God in our hearts. Um, of course, Christ said, I will give you a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and he shall never leave you. And that comforter, the Holy Spirit, is in fact the nature of God, which is love. So we truly are keepers of God in that sense. We are earthen vessels. Yes. 
that he has poured his spirit into. And we then can respond with this unconditional love. Um, you know, Christ, uh, uh, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, we'll all know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that word agape, which has one source, Jesus Christ, not the love mm-hmm. of the world, and it's unconditional love. So, you know, when things are swirling around us, either in our lives or in the church or whatever, we still can be a keeper of God and a bastion of love because we know what he has forgiven us for, took our sins to the cross, and then we forgive and we love going forward. Well, he, he forgives us for everything, but he can't forgive us until we forgive ourselves. Listen, I, 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 before the show, something else came to me. I, I would like to just sing this. They're talking about unconditional love. The second locution I got, I'm going to try to put it in the tense that I got it in and see how it goes with the music. So if you'd be patient and listen to this, I think it's tying right into what we're talking about right now. My second sure. locution on Cocoa Beach, Florida. So he's speaking to me. Joe, you are just a whisper in the miracle of time. What now, what how, what day, what decade or what year? Your sand grain in the moment washed away with just a tear. So take a chance and laugh at life. I've counted every hair. Fall into my arms of love. Be channels of my peace. Your grains of sand that rest in the moment of my grace you are the child of a kind and gentle god i shower you with blessings every day my love has no conditions there are no strings attached take a chance and laugh at life i've counted every hair fall into my arms of love Behold my holy face, my bleeding holy face, surrounded with my grace. Behold your holy face. Beautiful, Joe. There's no difference in faces. His is ours and ours is his. We're made in his image and likeness. There is no difference. The difference is guilt. And using our will for the wrong purpose and not going along with his will. That's the only difference with us, isn't it? Right. Right. You know, I think uh, so much of our lives can be centered around one amazing subject, and that is how God's love for us knows no bounds, but also has no end. And I want to read one of these amazing presentations that the Apostle Paul presented in his letter to the Romans. And I think what you are just singing about, where Paul says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Should be a triple exclamation mark. I think if we actually put that in our head every day, we actually, you know, allow that to sink into our heart, that this love is enduring, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And the key is the very end, in Christ Jesus our Lord, because that's where everything begins. So right. we can forgive ourselves and we can love ourselves because he first loved us and forgave us, and that love has no bounds and has no boundary in time. To me... You know, that speaks volumes about how we can look at ourselves and say, I forgive myself. 
or I, I can love it. myself unconditionally because he loved me first. There's, here's one of my locutions that has that same line from St. Paul in it. Remember the mighty love locution? This is God speaking to everybody, I believe. My beloved children, mighty is my love for you, full of mercy, open grace. Before the dawn of time, I knew you. Your voices are music to my ears. When I gaze upon you, I see myself. Everything you do pleases me immensely. I call to you. I thirst for you. I bleed for you. I die for you again. I feel your pains. I share your gains. I'm here for you, now and forever. Nothing can separate us except your will. Accept me. Please don't leave me again. God begs us to stay with him, but we don't hear him most of the time, do we? He does it through scripture. He does it through other people. And we still think we're condemned for eternity, don't we? A lot of us. Isn't it there? Yeah, yes. And that is the, the opposite mindset we're supposed to have. In fact, in the same chapter, Paul addressed the same thing. And it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. There's no end to God's desire to love us into loving ourselves, understanding his will, and that we're not in this alone. We are keepers of God through the Holy Spirit, and our Lord and Savior intercedes for us every day. I, 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 I'm, I'm moved to talk about Richard Rohr's position on something. Um, you know, he frequently says, this and I hope someone who is I'm quoting him right he said that there was no original sin before the council of Trent before the council of Trent and St. Augustine it was original blessing and not original sin so my question is why would the church want to change something like that and have people feel guilty instead of alive and loved by God why did they change that that's a question for um, someone who is much closer to um, canon law and church councils. I, I don't know the motivation behind that. But clearly in the Garden of Eden, God saw all that he created and it was good. And that included Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So clearly it was original blessing. There's no question. That's unmistakable from the scriptures. So God, God told Adam and Eve, eat not of the tree of knowledge. The apple was symbolic of knowledge. They didn't have knowledge. All they had was bliss. All they had was walking naked in the garden with God, and they had extreme joy. And they fell victim to a temptation to be God instead of being with God. Right. Didn't they? Yes, that's so the temptation. To I think to we, all, we, all, we all have that same possible fall. Every single spiritual book I've been reading lately talks about believing in the unknown instead of the known. The known is more powerful. What we can't see is far more important than what we can see, and what we don't know is far more important than what we think we know. That's what I believe. Right, yeah. There's a good book called The Cloud of Unknowing, The Pocket Bible of Priests, about getting out of yourself and out of the knowledge and into the unknown, which is God, the silence between words. Mm-hmm. The love in our hearts yeah. we can't understand. It's trying always to get into our mind and is blocked by our free will. Yeah. I mean, that's why Christ said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and sound trumpets and let everyone know how self-righteous you are. He said, go into your room, close the door, and then your God who sees you will bless you. You know, prayer is meant to be something between, you know, us and our Heavenly Father. And we leave our pride and our ego at the door. We close the door and we enter God's presence with complete humility. 
And that's when, you know, God can have a fertile mind and heart to bring to pass his will. Our, our pride and our ego, you know, what it says in, in the Old Testament, pride cometh before a fall. Man gets full yep. of himself and his abilities or his intellectual capacity, forgetting the fact that God gave it to him in the first place and thinking yep. he can do some great thing based on his yep. his own flesh and blood, mind, whatever. But we forget the fact that God created who we are. He's the one who empowered us with whatever gifts we have given us the gifts and our job is to remain humble and faithful which is frankly relatively straightforward there's nothing really hard about being humble and faithful it's just a matter of doing it yeah god gave us our ego god gave us our ego to protect us from danger not to protect us from god which people use it to do, right? Oh, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'll take care of this, God. I don't need you today. I can handle this myself, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's the misuse. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, obviously yeah. that's what puts the hose or puts your foot on the hose when you start, you know, behaving in that manner. And there are so many examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament of, of men, women, you know, succumbing to this terrible temptation to function like their gods. And that's the same temptation Lucifer gave into. You know, I, I shall ascend to the Most High, I shall be like the Most High, and, you know, he was just so full of himself. And he wants yeah. man to fall into the same trap because he knows where it leads, to, to sin and, you know, <laughs> stepping in potholes and walking into walls. And, you know, Satan likes that, but God has no interest in us doing that. He wants us to have a clear path, well lit by the word of God, our faithfulness and humility. Right. And this is all an interior spiritual battle in each person, not every person, each person. You know, it's, it's a spiritual yeah. journey custom made for each person. And the devil's, <laughs> the devil's guys are there and God's guys are there. And it's a battle, isn't it? We have, we have five, I read a book, we have 5,000 thoughts in random memory at all times. Yeah. Father Bill McCarthy has a diagram of the human mind that he shows once in a while. And 10% of it, there's like this little bubble in the mind, and that's Satan's dominion, 10%. 90% God's dominion. But boy, he does expand himself into God's dominion quite frequently, doesn't he? He pushes the edges all the time trying to get us to go on his team. Yeah, yeah, he sure does. You know, and and God, allows the leash to, God allows the leash to be loosened because he couldn't do anything without God's permission. He has to have God's permission to tempt us, doesn't he? Yeah, I, yes. You know, um, this, this is talked about um, by Peter, by James, that resist the devil and he will flee from you. And you resist him the same way Christ did. It is written. You know, that's, you respond with the word of God. You don't respond with what is culturally correct in that particular moment in time, you respond mm-hmm. with the eternal truth of God's word the same way Jesus did when he was tempted of the devil. He resisted the devil by quoting, you know, it is written. So this, that's in James 4. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There you go. Two things. Submit yourselves to God, one. Two, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So that's how you deal with this, this spiritual darkness that truly is in the world. It is a spiritual battle. There's no question about it. But the bigger picture is Christ won the spiritual battle almost 2,000 years ago when right. he became our ultimate sacrifice for sin, opening the door to eternal life. All we have to do is just acknowledge it be humble to it, be faithful to it, and live it. We're already it's saved. Actually, the devil keeps trying, they already, we're already saved, but the devil keeps trying to convince us that we're not. Well, of course, yeah. That's that's the that's the lie. Well, it's already saved us. We can go backwards if we take the wrong information. Right. You know. Yeah, I mean, Hebrews says those who are sanctified are perfected forever. Hebrews ten fourteen. So if we are sanctified in Christ, then we are perfected forever. And that perfection is not our flesh, of course. 
It's the spirit within that God has in us. That is perfect, and that's what will live on forever. So, right. yeah, if Satan comes along and says, no, you're not perfected forever, and you're not sanctified. You know, you're none of that. Well, we, we just resist him by quoting, it is written. The same yeah. thing Jesus did. Same yeah. thing. Another, another, way of God, our example. another way of expressing that is our true self. The part of us that is a part of God exists forever. And the more we get rid of ourselves, the more we become likened to that. And right. that lasts. I lasts forever, and therefore we're part of Christ, and we last forever also. That part of us. Right. And if we get, if we get rid of as many parts of ourselves as we can before we die, the second death is as nothing. Getting rid of the false yeah. self is the problem. That's the hard right. part. Yeah, you know, it all begins with the Son of God. You know, when Jesus was talking to his apostles, he, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So you have this whole host of, you know, opinions on who Jesus is. But what about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that's where our deliverance begins. We recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed right. one prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. He is the Son of the living God, not just a great prophet, not just an interesting philosopher. That doesn't right. get you anywhere. The thing that makes me understand that is the good thief, as soon as he recognized the Lord as Jesus, that's when he was told he was going to enter paradise with them, right? All he had to do was say he knew he was Jesus. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, our Lord demonstrated the new covenant. He came to bring on the cross a condemned soul to us. Uh, what a story that is. You have a person on the cross with an obvious criminal record. If anybody has a reason to feel guilty, it would be that poor soul hanging on the cross, yes. condemned to die. I mean, how much more guilty can you feel than him? And what kind of criminal record does he have? And in a moment of time, he goes from a condemned soul to a saved soul. Right. Just like said, when Jesus, Jesus also went when he appeared, appeared to St. Faustina as the Divine Mercy and asked her to draw a picture, you know, he complained to her about people not appreciating his wounds, not appreciating what, you know, he wants to be loved, and when people don't love him, it hurts him. Yeah, because All he, he has can't... to do is love him. Yeah. Right, because he, his, he can't work as mightily. You know, when Jesus talked about working miracles in... in the land and the surrounding areas. Um, he talked about how he could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. You know, right. unbelief hurts him and us because it blocks God's ability to accomplish. And, you know, if you have this faith of a mustard seed, you could move around. Right. He, he, he begged for us right from the cross, and everybody under the cross heard it. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He took human right. form, and that was his final report to the Father. Forgive them, Father. Right. You know, I've been there. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't know they're hurting us, you know. They don't know. Right. And we right. still don't most of the time until we wake up. Well, really, the waking reality up, is... That waking up, in my mind, is getting out of God's way, getting Joe out of God's way so God can work, you know. Joe's the major right. obstacle to God. It, it's, it's a matter of relinquishing your self-control and letting him control things. And, boy, what a ride it is when he starts driving instead of you trying to drive, you know. And, and <laughs> it fluctuates. It fluctuates. We always, you know, we let him drive once in a while, and then we say, okay, that's enough. I think I'll take the wheel again. You know? Right. Yeah, well, that's something that our mind will do. So that's why it's so important to stay centered fellowshipping with believers, you know, putting God's word in your heart, praying, and doing the works of God. And, um, you know, the book, uh, Treasures in Heaven, that 
Christ inspired me to write. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is the key. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So God's not mocked. He, he knows what we're doing in our heart. He has a candle in our soul. And he can see our intentions. So if our desire is to store up treasures in heaven, that's where our heart is. Our heart is centered on God. And if it's not, then we will be amassing amazing amounts of treasures on earth because that's where the heart is. So it all comes down to where your heart is. And the more you soften it with prayer, yeah. fellowship, and the word of God, the greater you know, probability you have of storing up treasures in heaven. You, you struck a key word for me, desire. You know, in, in my 12-step work, the only requirement for membership is a desire to get sober. And I think the only requirement for salvation is a desire to be saved. All you have to do is be willing, and he'll take you the rest of the way, won't he? Exactly. And, you know, Christ made that very clear. You know, in, in John 3, when he talked about, uh, you know, Nicodemus comes to him at night, because, you know, you, you couldn't openly support Jesus. And Nicodemus, being of the Jewish ruling council, came at night so no one would know it. And um, he said, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one could perform these signs, these miracles you are doing, if God were not with him. And, of course, what did Christ say? He went straight to the miracle of being born again, born of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And then he went on to explain how it's being born of water and the spirit. And, you know, back in Hosea, there's a prophecy about becoming sons of the living God. And that's exactly what this is. Being born again, born of God, is becoming a son of the living God. And then in the same breath, that's where we have the famous verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So there is Jesus explaining what it means to be born again, believing in him. And, of course, throughout the Bible it expounds upon what it means to believe. But it doesn't say, you know, doing uh, works to be saved. That was the old covenant, earning righteousness. Nowhere does Jesus right. say you are to earn righteousness. In fact, he said we are to ask and you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be open to you. These are the gifts God gives us, righteousness and the Holy Spirit and salvation. They're all gifts. Every breath is a gift when you get right down to it. And the yeah, breath is yeah. the Holy Spirit. I mean, how simple can it get? Every breath we take, we're inhaling right. the Holy Spirit, and every exhalation, we're getting rid of some bad stuff. Not just carbon, well, not carbon dioxide either. There's stuff going in and out all the time. Right. Exactly. Yep. Earth, wind, yep. and fire. What better description of the, you know, earth, air, and fire. Holy Spirit. Right. Every atom is a part of God. There's no exclusions. The smallest form of life. Three parts. Proton, neutron, and electron. Positive, negative, and neutral. Trinity. Unbelievable when you get into it, isn't it? It you is. see God in everything after a while. That's why I was at this babysitting job, and I saw God in the flowers and in the rocks and in the family's home and everything else, and I wrote a poem about it yesterday. It was amazing. It's just you get into these states where you know not you running the show, and that's where I was yesterday on a couch in uh, Golden Bridge, New York, watching the 11-year-old kid. He was still sleeping, and I had to take him someplace when he woke up, and I just started saying, you know, what a beautiful place to be today in this moment with you, you know. And mm. then flow just came out, flow. When you give him a compliment, he gives you flow. That's what I think, you know. So, well, that's 
part of what you're talking about is being in the moment and enjoying the moment. What a gift that is, as opposed to always looking backward to some fun time you had years ago or, you know, hoping somewhere in the future you might be able to accomplish something. But to be able to be satisfied and be thankful for the current moment, that's a real gift. And that's what you just were referring to. Yeah. Yeah, God always I'm, exists in the moment. He's never in the past or the future. He's always just right present now. The power right. of now with God, you know. We right. just have to turn around and get into that sacred space when we're having problems. We don't have to keep having problems. Unless somebody has a gun at your head, there's not much happening right in front of you that you have to take care of, you know. Yeah. Yep, exactly. That's what he gave us our ego for, to, to survive. He didn't give our, us our ego to avoid him, but that's what most people do. They use the ego to avoid God. Terrible, right? Terrible. And I did it when I was a child. I was afraid of my whole family, so I built up this tremendous wall around myself to protect myself, and it took me seven years in sobriety to get rid of it before I got rid of the fear that the wall caused. Hiding behind a wall is no fun. I can tell you that from personal experience, because that wall is blocking God out. Yeah. Ego. Edging God out, we call it in the program. Ego. Edging God out. It happens so slowly, too. You don't even know it's happening. Pretty soon. You know, you start off naked in the garden, just like Adam and Eve. And then you wind up full of all this vile stuff like the Pharisees, you know? And it happens so gradually, you don't even know it's happening because the other one is so cunning, baffling, and powerful and takes his time doing things, too. He's very good at, at creating a web to catch you that you don't even know is being manufactured. Right. Temptation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Paul speaks of how Satan has, you know, blinded minds, um, keeping them from the light you know, of the glorious gospel of Christ. You know, certainly right. Lucifer, Lucifer is actively interested in keeping spiritual darkness, you know, but, we have we are lights of the world, and Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, um, who used to hold the power of death, and, and Christ is the one who now has the keys. But in 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 Luke, when Christ stands up at the synagogue, Joe, what what we're talking about is what Jesus Christ prophesied, and what Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah. So when he stood up to read, he found the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, meaning the humble. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, those who are Mm -hmm. in spiritual prisons, recovery of sight to the blind, obviously physical and spiritual, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Joe, you and I were participated in this. You and I both used to be... um, you know, setting up our walls, prisoners with our walls all around us, you know, spiritually blind, uh, oppressed by this and oppressed by that, you know, not fully understanding what Jesus is designed to be to us. And when his light breaks through, these prophecies become our personal reality, set free. Those who, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know, we personally experienced that, and we continue to personally experience it. What a blessing to know 2,000 years later, these biblical prophecies are being personally fulfilled in each one of us who choose to believe Jesus is the Messiah. Well, good stuff. No, I just came, I just came across this thing in my notes, surrendering is believing. Have I shared that with you? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't know if this makes any sense, but here it, is. here it goes. I haven't seen this in a long time. I wrote it on March 3rd, 2017 at 12.42 a.m. Surrendering is believing. I can't believe in God if I can't believe in myself. Therefore, I believed in nothing. And nothing, my false self, was my problem. I was wired in reverse because I didn't believe in a higher power. God was nothing, and so was I. So if I drank nothing to death, it didn't matter to the person I had become. There were no consequences. Now I believe in God, 
I'm a part of that God, and that God is a part of me, not apart from me, thanks to the 12 steps. I communicate with that God every day, and at times, I'm in constant conscious cat contact with that God. I have found that listening to my God means listening to other people and my true self in that order. And I take all the thoughts I need and I leave the rest because resentments, mine and other people's, are like stray cats. If I don't feed them, they will go away. <laughs> resentments are like stray cats. If you don't feed them, they will go away. If I don't feed the thoughts that I don't need, they'll leave. But if I feed them, they'll hang around because they're like Velcro. Negative thoughts are like Velcro, and positive thoughts slip off like Teflon. I have to focus on what's positive, and the only thing I can really control in this life is my attitude. That's the one string I can control. If, if I try to stay positive and focus on, focus on God or what's good in my life, I can ignore the negative thoughts. But it's hard sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, well... They stick like glue and the negative the positive thoughts are fleeting. Right, yeah. It's harder to hold the positive thoughts like, than the negative thought. Yeah. And we can't get down on ourselves if we got this negative thought rattling around in our head. You know, we do all we can to remove it, pray it away, you know, yep. don't feed it. But, you know, the last thing you want to do is be guilty or feel guilty about something because you've got this thought in your head. You know, just do all you know to do to be faithful and focus on the Word of God and focus on prayer. And, you know, it, it, it can't stay. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that includes his negative thoughts. Just resist them by not feeding them. Right. We have a choice of which thoughts we feed, and there's a lot of thoughts up there. We can always feed the good ones and let the bad ones die, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, choice, everything, filing, yeah. Yeah. In the big filing cabinet we have, you know, with all our memories, um, the last thing we need is to have negative memories continue to impact our present and our future. You know, that's right. why forgiveness is so important. If we need to forgive, forgive. You know, that's in, you know, be our father. You know, if we need to forgive someone, then we forgive so we can be set free and move on or whatever it may be. You know, yes. whatever is necessary, we cannot let the past ruin our presence you know we, we're, we're we're too good for that we're we're, we're god's chosen exactly. vessels the past is a slippery slope for most people right right yep yep, yep. got to stay out of there and stay stay out of the future if you get in the future you have anxiety if you get in the past you have depression both things are crippling staying in the moment and staying in the day is so powerful spiritually when you get to stay in the day Instead of going backwards, it's a tremendous step forward. And then you get to the point where you can have those special moments. You can't have the special moments until you make every day special. Right. A day at a time. Our Father, give us this day, not give us this life our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The day at a time mm -hmm. principle is scriptural. Right. It's the only prayer right. that God actually gave us, telling us stay in the day and forgive your... Right. Forgive other people, uh, and you'll be forgiven. It's right in there, right? So it's a daily process. And then if right. you have a bad day, it's easier to get over if you realize it was only a day. And, and what I try to do is if my day starts going bad, get down on my knees and start it over. That's a good idea. Don't yeah. start your day over if it starts going south. You don't have to keep going downhill. Although you'll have somebody trying to lead you there once you start thinking negatively. Right. And sometimes you got to hit the pause button and yes. get on your knees and say, I can't do this alone. You know, and then pray or about meditate it. or just, just start focusing on your breath. That's God coming right. in and out, you know. Yeah. Right. Richard yeah, Brown I, recommends saying the word Yahweh when you're breathing. Hmm. It's no, it's no, uh, no vowels. Yahweh, the, the ancient word for God. Hmm. Yah, inhalation, way, exhalation. He also says that when you're born, your first word is Yahweh, even though you don't know you're saying Yahweh. Yahweh is the sound of breath coming in and out, and that's what they used to call God. And the Hebrews believe it was a sacred word that you would never speak. You don't have to speak it because you're always breathing it. 
That's so very cool, though. Yeah. The I, first thing I, you ever say when you come out of the womb after you get slapped is Yahweh. Your first breath is saying Yahweh, and your last breath is saying Yahweh. And yeah. then you're with him after calling for him all your life, silently with your breath. Each breath is calling him that's, to do Yeah, with that's you. actually, thanks for sharing that. That's pretty profound. It is. When I heard that, it changed me a lot. I always used to think I just came out of the womb kicking and screaming and fighting, and I'm still doing it. But while I'm fighting, I'm calling his name with every breath. Mm. And it has no vowels. Yahweh. Mm. It's just like a wave, like peace. Yeah. Every breath. Yeah. Calling daddy. Abba father. Calling Abba. With the ancient word for his name. The ancient Hebrew word. You know, it, it never ceases to amaze you, the, the knowledge of God and how profound and you know, how simple it truly is. Yeah. And, um, I mean, to me, this the Bible is, is the most fascinating uh, way to live, studying it, learning it, living it. I mean, you realize right. that there's no way the hand of man could have written this, that when Paul yeah. said that, you know, he received this by revelation from Jesus Christ. You believe him. When you really understand this, this Bible and how intricate and yet how simple it is and how God accomplished our salvation, how he defeated yeah. Lucifer through his son, it's thrilling. It's exciting yeah. to, to really understand that here we are in the 21st century, almost 2,000 years removed from the resurrection, and we have the fruits of the benefit of that crucifixion and resurrection today, that, that God's blessing just continues generation after generation. And here we are um, representing our Lord and Savior all these generations later, firmly committed to him to do his will. And right. I wanted to read something that Christ said um, in the Gospels. He said, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. If, if, if you read that every day and believe it, mm -hmm. you cannot possibly be the same person. Putting those words in your head, Paul says to put on the mind of Christ. Well, how do we do that? We, the mind of Christ, it's, it's the words of Christ. Put them in our head. Uh, that's where it all begins. So this great comfort that our Lord gave us, so profound. Here we are. We should, we should just be so thankful in the 21st century to be alive in this day and time, to have access to the Bible, to have access to this truth, and to freely live it in this country. What a blessing. Definitely a big blessing. Yeah, I'm, I, I am so grateful to be alive in this day and time, to be able to live this word. Me too, and I, I admire your scripture knowledge and everything, and it's certainly the way the Lord is speaking to you all the time through scripture, and that's a great gift that you have there, to be able to understand that as you do, and to have that doctor's degree in divinity and stuff, that's amazing. Well, again, thank you, but really, he's the one who created who I am, and he's the one working mightily within me the same way he works mightily within you. We have different gifts. Uh, we, we bring different um, plates to the Lord's table, you know, what we're able to provide. And everyone is in the body of Christ fulfilling a unique role. And I just, you know, I just love soaking up the Word of God. And Me too. I just want to finish that one section in uh, when Christ was speaking. He continued by saying, Verily, verily, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, 
which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Amen. Amen and that's amen. What, that's what he had me singing in the guard booth. One sip of wine, oh. one bread in your time, one hope for mankind. Right. I lo- Joe, I absolutely love that, what that, that song that put, he put in your heart. Can you, can you actually, do you have that in front of you now or just? Apply? I don't need it in front of me. I'll never forget that. You don't forget, but you know, Richard Rohr, I went to Richard Rohr's conference in Albuquerque and I shared uh, through the ancient, I shared my locution. I was in front of a thousand people. Right? I was scared. I was at a microphone. He had walk up, people talking at the mic. And I shared one of my things and he looked at me with one of those spiritual looks from the stage. And I was about 50 feet away from him. And I said, I often wonder whether this is me thinking or the, or the Lord talking to me. And he said from the podium, he said, Joe, he said, you wouldn't even remember that if it was you speaking. Amazing, right? Uh-huh. So here's, here's one sip of wine, one bread in our time, which I will never forget. One sip of wine, one bread in your time, one hope for mankind. Who do you go to when dark days are near? Now that the word of your day is fear, remember my mercy is always near. Revealed long ago by the spirit of love, I am alive and dancing a waltz. As the air of mercy follows my cross, so wake up and listen, my kind-hearted friend. My mercy owes forgiveness, but your judgments offend. So stay with me in your sacred place. Just pray for mercy and receive ye my grace. For my heart is as soft as the breath of an angel. I whisper my message in the still of my might. Come and receive me in the presence of light. Come love you, Jesus, come give up your fight. I'm Jesus, Jesus, Savior of men. My mercy is forgiveness, but your judgments offend. So stay with me in your sacred place. Just pray for mercy and behold my holy face. Surrounded with my grace. It just has such a beautiful rhythm to it with beautiful lyrics. I often regret singing that song at my father's house because that's what put Dave over the edge to fan us from the conference. He doesn't like that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I just find that I, I'm still forced. I made the mistake of giving him my book and sharing that at the conference after he spoke. And he got offended and kicked us out. That's my read on the whole situation. And You know, I've been reading this book about Padre Pio, and it gave me a lot of comfort. And I don't think I'm even close to being a saint, although that's all of our journeys. I see, I see a lot of Christ's journey in my own life to a minimum degree, you know. But in this situation, with members of my own church persecuting me for something I wrote that I believe came for Jesus, is like the last straw. Padre Pio was vanished. He had, to, he had to be sequestered for years while I proved that he was legitimate. And in addition to that, the church continued. After he built the hospital with a change in popes, the new pope had him, his character assassinated again. He sent a special investigator there, and they wiretapped everything. They think they might have even wiretapped his confessional to get information on him because he would not turn over the hospital to the order to pay back debts because it was donations from America for the hospital use only. This is what, why 70% of Catholics don't go to church anymore. The leadership has got to change to match the Lord's will and not their own. You know, I love AA. I'm in that. We're all trusted servants. There are no leaders. There's no organization. They just have people in New York to feed everybody supplies, and we're never told what to do. Everything's just a suggestion. Jesus didn't come down and boss people around like these militants in the church are doing. He loved everybody. And the most radical thing he did was knock over some tables because they were mixing the world with his father's property in the temple with the Pharisees. All right. these Pharisees. When are they going to learn what they're doing to his people in the name of the church? 
Uh, no, those who are greatest among you are to be servants of all. It's like... Father Bill McClarty called me back today, and he said, Joe, oh, don't he... worry. He said, I'm going to pray to get another avenue for your book. I said, I, I have to let them do what they're doing, Father. I, I was, originally, I was going to fight them. I was going to do this. I said, but, you know, they have the right to restrict their membership to the type of people they want because they're a nonprofit organization who has endorsements from the church. They're not the church. They can pick and choose who they allow to attend. They might be violating my civil liberties, but I can't go. I can't do anything that would get the church a worse name than it already has by retaliating against them publicly. That would just be sad. But the state, I believe the church is being crucified just like Jesus was. We're the body of Christ. We are the church. The titular church needs a facelift. The Pope's trying to do it, but he can't get through all the muddle. How am I going to do anything? I just got to accept what happened, grow up, and go my own direction. And Father Bill said he's going to pray for another uh, avenue. He's going to pray hard for another avenue for my book. And the next day, I got a letter from the Stanford uh, Hispanic community I've been involved with for many years, and they want me to take a table at their event at Cove Island with 200 tables and thousands of guests walking around Cove Island looking at information. And it's the exact same cost. As the, uh, it's the exact same cost as the event that I was going to, $200 for a table. And yeah, I'll look at that. Friends. The door opened up. Immediately after I surrendered and talked to Father well, Bill. That's exa- that, Something that's else peculiar happened to me. I went to a, 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 a harbor festival in Stanford, and I'm not going to say much more, but I met somebody at the harbor festival at a, as, at a, at a, at a booth. And I was talking to him. I shared some poems. And he said, are you Catholic? I said, yes, I'm Catholic. He said, come over here. I don't want to say this in front of my people. And he came outside the booth, and we went by the water, by the railing. And I can't say any more. But it might wind up getting me to talk to Pope Francis. Gee. Directly, yeah. I have to have dinner with him. When uh, he talk to- about, yeah, well... One door closes, another door is open. Now, God, God is not going to let his truth go unheard. No, he won't, despite the effort of people who pretend they're being his pals. Right. And they're destroying his church, and they don't even know. They, they think that uh, they're holy already, and that's unfortunate. Nobody's holy already. Everybody's in the process of getting holy, and this is a spiritual journey, and it's the short leg of the journey, just like Christ. Jesus was in human form, short leg of his journey. He's there forever. He always was, just like we always was. And we're all, we're all part of I Am, and we're all going to be part of I Am. It's just a matter of where, where we locate ourselves in the next life by what we do in this. I don't know. It's pretty simple for me now, but I, I was just as complicated as the people that are doing this to me right now, so I don't have any right to, to try to control their journey either. We just have to accept everybody and uh, love everybody no matter what happens. Isn't that true? And I've forgiven them. Sometimes I wonder if I should have. Should should have made a big deal out of it, gotten some media attention, which I could have done. And uh, if my motive was selfish, it would be horrible. And if it was selfless, it would be right. okay. So we never know. We never know. Best well, to see the thing go out yeah. They have a good event. So if they didn't have a good event, I'd be all over them. I really would. Right. In the name of charismatic apps, they're discriminating against people with gifts of charism. And we're just as much of a church as they are, part of the church as they are. I mean, the Catholic Church is so much bigger than they're letting it be at that event. Yeah, that's that issue. Unfortunately, it's all too true. You know, there's there is a divide. It's unfortunate, but um, you know, charisms go right back to. Christ's own prophecy, the apostles. Well, there's so I'm much. I'm going to get in trouble. Maybe I'm going to say this. The people that are meeting in the basements of church all over the place, including 12-step people and charismatic people, belong upstairs, telling their stories. And then the churches would be full. Seventy percent of people would come back to Mass if that happened. And the reason is deliverance. You know, there's so yeah. much deliverance when you embrace the work of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's what people need. That's what Christ came to bring, the truth which delivers us from, you know, our own selves or 
cleanses us, purges us of sin, and then the gifts of the Spirit just energize our ministries so we could give even more. So, you know, it's designed to be this, this, this you know, role of the Holy Spirit that yeah. makes here's, 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 what, here's what I honestly believe, honestly believe is going on. 70% of Americans don't vote. We have the scum at the top, right? 70% no. of Catholics don't go to church. You can't change anything if you don't go. You can't change anything if you don't vote. People, like the people I dealt with, are going to stay on top until somebody takes them down by showing up. You don't have to do anything mean. Just show up and, and let your opinion be known, you know? Uh, right. The charismatic movement is kind of dwindling away. It was explosive in the 60s. I mean, they were filling baseball stadiums, healing each other and praying over each other, and then it's, the church started administrating it and putting it into a little eight-week course instead of letting it fly, and look what happened. Yeah, that, what happened. That, that's, of course, another story. I, I hear what you're saying. There's no question about it. You know, I guess the fact that all the popes have given their blessing is very encouraging. Um, I'm very thankful for that. Oh, yeah. That they they five minutes left. Let me get off. Let me get off my high horse before I get infected with the same stuff they have. So, yeah. and I'll be saying my cause is the only cause, and stick with Joe, and you'll yeah. be saved. And then I'll be as bad as them. So I'm not going to do that. Yep. Well, you, know, you, re- you respond when, when you use when you use fear to get people to do something. It doesn't work too long, does it? Because fear's the enemy. No. And no. People get scared and then they leave. It's supposed to and be inspired love and hope by love. And inclusiveness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is what the media does, too. The media is responsible to their sponsors. The sponsors want people to spend money. The news is full of horrible stuff, even though there's a lot of good stuff going on in the world, and that's just the way they want it. When I tried to get the face put on the media with my media contacts that I've known for a long time, I called one of them and I said, Sarah, I have a picture of God in the sky in Vero Beach, Florida. Would you like to do a story? And she told me. Joe, I can't do a story. If I did a story on God, I'd lose my job. You know? That's horrible. Hmm. Now, the other thing, the thing that the church is doing is, if you don't come here into our churches, you're going to go to hell. That was the past teaching. It hasn't changed so much. Do it our way or go to hell. That's not the way to get people to come. That's the way to get people to go. Right. you got to have something for them. you got to feed the poor and the hungry. You have to open your kitchens up and... Show people Jesus. People can't live on doctrine and, and scripture alone. They need variety, you know. Things right. have changed. Church has to do something to get people back in. Father Alamon at the Basilica in Stanford, before I wrote this book, and one of the reasons I allowed myself to write it, even what, what, against my own gut feeling, was because Father Al said to me, he's 86 years old, retired fighter pilot, and he's married, and he lost his wife, and he went into the priesthood. He said, We've got to do something to get Catholics back to church. Seventy percent of Catholics don't go to church. And he does it the way you should. He preaches love and acceptance. That's what we need. Mm-hmm. Charismatic priest. Right. Except from everything the parishioners want to do, so long as they don't go too far off. You know, making them feel welcome and feeding the hungry and the poor in their kitchens, I think. That's the program I wanted to develop, and nobody wants to listen right. to that. So. Okay, why don't you take the last three minutes? Uh, I've talked too much already. And, uh, you know, close it no, I, with a nice prayer of your choice. Sure, sure. I just want to say, you know, just briefly following up with your situation relative to you and your book and doors opening. You now you talked to Father Bill. Father Bill said he would pray for you. You know, you were honest with him and he was honest with you. And doors opened up that might not have opened up prior. So exactly. you responded with love, you responded with prayer to a difficult situation, and now you have not one, but perhaps multiple avenues to share God's word. So, you know, God does not, you know, remain idle in these situations. He wants his truth to be heard. So I think right. your response was right on the money. Just, you know, do what Christ would have done. Forgive you know something, it, you know something? It, it, if it was my response, it would be wrong, but I think it might have been God's response, so that's great, you know. Yeah, I think that was definitely God's response. Yeah. So I wanted just to share that. I thought that was great. I honestly didn't know what had become 
uh, of the situation until just now when you were talking. And um, so closing out with prayer, I, I love to just close with the same prayers that, you know, the apostles close with. Amen. And um, so in Hebrews, the, the closing prayer is beautiful. So if I may close. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Bill. God bless you. We're out of time. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Cry Oneness. Have a great week, and please listen to us next week. Uh, God bless you all. God bless you, Bill. Thank you for co-hosting tonight. See you next week. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.